welcome to the Every Nation Dorado Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message. Good morning. Uh, my name is Loide Nidengwa. I'm one of the campus missionaries here in Every Nation Ventuk. And today we will be praying uh, for one of the nations, as you know, uh, hopefully you know that um, usually the first Sunday of the month we take one nation and we pray for that nation uh, because the Lord Jesus Christ said, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Um, so today we'll be praying for the nation of Croatia. The capital city is Zagreb. Uh, the, the main religion is Catholicism. The population is 4.2 million. And they, we have one every nation uh, church there that has been planted recently. So we have two prayer points, four prayer points actually, but we will start off with the first two prayer points. We will pray into that and then we will pray into the last two prayer points. Okay, so the first prayer point, we are going to be praying uh, for the lead church planter and the team. We're just going to be praying for the relationships within the team themselves, the relationship within the team, and then the relationships within the community that they are engaging. So we're going to pray for effective uh, outreaches and then effective communication within the team. And the second prayer point is that we're going to pray against uh, religious and ethnic bondages. We're going to pray that religious and ethnic bondages will be broken um, in the nation. As we said that the main religion is Catholicism. And it's not necessarily that the people are practicing Catholicism as a religion. They identify it with it almost like as a, as a name. So let's pray into that. Uh, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the nation of Croatia. We thank you, Father God, that you love um, that nation. We thank you, Father God, for Hansi and the team that are leading the Every Nation Church plan there. Lord, we pray, Father God, for effective communication in the mighty name of Jesus within the team. I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that, Lord, you will anoint their outreach efforts in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray, Father God, that you will give them good communication and good relationships with the people in their community in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Father. Your word says that where there is unity, the Lord commands and blessing. And we pray, Father God, for your blessing upon the Hansi and his team in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray that there will be unity, that they will be in one accord. And I pray, Father God, that um, it's that unity that is in the team, that it will also spill out in the rest of the church and in the rest of the plant. And I pray, Father God, that love will mark every single one of the outreach efforts in Jesus' name. Lord, we also just pray um, for, for bondages in, within Croatia to break. We pray, Father God, for religious and ethnic bondages, Lord Jesus Christ, to be broken, that spirit of religion that keeps people bound in the mighty name of Jesus, that it will be broken. We pray, Father God, that the veils that the enemy has placed over the people's eyes so that they cannot see the glory of the risen Lord, that that veil will be removed and that when the gospel is proclaimed, that nothing will stand in, um, in the way of the gospel proclamation in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we pray um, for your hand to, of restoration upon Croatia in the mighty name of Jesus. And we just declare uh, freedom in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so the, the last two prayer points, we're going to pray for reconciliation uh, between the Croats uh, and the, Bos the Bosnians and the Serbs. So there's been century rivalry there. And it's still present even to this day. It can be felt even in Croatia. So we're just going to pray for reconciliation. And then we're going to pray for cross-church uh, unity, that there will actually be unity among the churches in Croatia. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, O oh God, that you are the one who heals every wound. You heal every broken heart. And we thank you, Father God, for the crowds in Croatia. We pray, Father God, for the Bosnians. Lord, we pray, Father God, for the Serbs. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that where there's been long wounds that have been there um, for generations, Lord, we pray, Father God, that there'll be healing, that they will actually experience 
healing in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, Father God, that you will heal every wound. We pray, Father God, for your love, that your love will prevail in the hearts and in that nation in the mighty name of Jesus, that your river of love will begin to move in that nation and every head, Lord Jesus Christ, every wall of division that the enemy has been planted there for years, that it will be broken. And Lord, we speak reconciliation in Croatia and with their neighboring countries in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I also just pray uh, for unity among the churches. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that um, your word says that by these people will know that you are truly my disciples when you love one another. I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that there will be unity we, among the churches in the mighty name of Jesus, that believers will walk together to advance your kingdom in Croatia. We thank you for the nation of Croatia. We pray, Father God, that you will bless them. And we declare, Father God, that let there be revival in Croatia. In Jesus' name, we thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Hello everyone and welcome to our online platform. It's wonderful to be together and share the word of God on this uh, medium. And it's an opportunity that we have today to get into the word of God. Some of you might not be able to come into the sanctuary and the church service where we are, but we believe that even in this way, God is able to reach you. We've had so many testimonies of people sharing concerning how the word of God has been impacting their lives. If it is your first time here or if you have not yet subscribed, we want to encourage you to please do subscribe, like the video, switch on the notification button, share this video also with your friends and family as a blessing unto them as well. Today we're starting with a new series on the theme called Set Apart. It's called Set Apart Nation. And uh, throughout the year, we are going to be continuing on this theme of, set, of being set apart, how God distinguishes us and sets apart individuals and nations and families and companies uh, for his special purpose. And that is the blessing because it distinguishes us from all the other things. And so it makes us special unto God. And so we're going to look over the next few weeks, the next three weeks, concerning how God does this on a national scale. The first week today, we're going to talk about how nations belong to God. And then the second week, we're going to deal with how nations are ruled from the heavenlies, from the realm of the spirit. And we'll explain the details of this. We'll also give you some examples, real examples of actual nations around the world that have been dedicated to different purposes and different deities and the results of that. And then in the third week, we'll talk about the principles for a godly nation. Now, let me pray for us and then we can get into the word of God. So, Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for the privilege of hearing from your word and sharing your word. We pray, Lord, that your anointing will teach us today, that it, you will lead us, Lord, into revelation that sets us free and causes us to prosper. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. All right, so you might be asking, why are we dealing with this subject? Why don't we just deal with the subject on a, a micro level, on my personal life level, uh, what I need to do uh, day to day, week to week, so that I can please God and fulfill God's purposes for my life? Why are we talking about nations? The reason, number one, is because God doesn't only deal on the individual level. As much as we have a relationship with God, we see from the word of God that there is a relationship that God has with nations as well, with groups of people. And so this is very important. And then secondly, what happens in a nation affects the individuals within that nation. So you cannot say, look, I'm a, I'm a believer, I'm a child of God, I live in this nation, whether it be Namibia, or whether it be the UK, whether it be uh, the USA, whether it be South America, or, or Brazil, or Portugal, or, or China, whichever nation you dwell in, whichever nation you live in, the tenets and the, and the, the dynamics of that nation have an effect on your life. And the book of Timothy, uh, the Apostle Paul speaks to Timothy and he says, I want men to pray. First, let them intercede for kings 
and for rulers and for people in authority because we want to live a quiet life, minding our own business, working with our hands, you know, and experiencing the blessing of the Lord. Why? Because on the national level, what happens there, what is decided and determined by leaders and kings have an effect, has an effect on the individuals within that nation, on the families within that nation. And so it's very important, even if you look at the Old Testament, when the Israelites were exiled into Babylon, the Lord tells them through the prophets that they ought to pray for the prosperity of the nation where they dwell because if the nation prospers, they themselves will also prosper. And so this is why we have to look at this subject and also peer behind the veil, look behind the veil of what's happening around the world in a spiritual sense and how that is affecting our lives. It will give you a sense that God is sovereign over the, over the nations and that we ought to see him as Lord over all. This message of the gospel is not just for the Christians or for the church or for some people or for the Israelites. No, it is for the whole world. And we'll see now from the word of God how the, the gospel applies to all nations and all peoples and all individuals. So that every single man, every single woman that you meet is eligible for the gospel. This applies to every single person. This is not just a, a, a message that is tiered based on your background. Okay, you come from the Middle East or you come from America or you come from Europe. And so Christianity is the white man's, quote unquote, white man's religion. And, and, and no, this is an error and a misunderstanding that the gospel, Jesus Christ came to save the whole world. His sacrifice is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. And so when we see from the scriptures, we are going to realize that the relevance of the Christian message is for the whole world and for every nation in the earth. Awesome. So I'm excited for us to be able to get into this message. So today we're talking about how nations belong to God. Nations belong to God. Now, what is a nation? It is important that we understand from the definition point of view, the word of God uses the word ethnos. When it talks about nations, it is the word that where, where ethnicity is derived from. So it is more specifically and more accurately described as tribes, tribes or people groups, ethnic groups. And so, yes, we're talking about states as well, meaning the, the Republic of Namibia or South Africa or Zimbabwe or, or, or Morocco or France as, as nation states. But it doesn't get limited to that. When God is speaking about a people group, when he's talking about how nations belong to him, he can refer to a very small group that is a part of a certain nation. And in the spirit realm, the allocations and distributions of supervisions and jurisdictions concerning nations pertain not only at the national level, when we say national level, state level, but it also pertains to the tribal level. And there are certain tribes and people groups that have certain deities and have certain covenants in the heavenly realm that have an effect on them. And so we're going to be dealing at all these various tiers. Okay, so number one, the principle here, number one, is that the whole earth is the Lord's. The whole earth belongs to Jesus Christ. <laughs> now, this might be an arrogant statement to make for some people because they feel that, no, the earth can't belong to a religious leader. Jesus is not a, a religious leader. The book of Colossians explains how through him all things were made for him and by him. And so Jesus is heir of all things. He is the creator. Jesus Christ, the word of God, the word made flesh, God in the flesh. And so the nations, the whole earth belongs to him. Let's look here at Psalm 24, starting with verse 1 and 2. It says, the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof, the fullness thereof means everything that fills the earth 
belongs to God. And this is not only the earth, the universe and all created entities, whether seen or unseen, whether thrones or dominions or powers, were made by Christ and for him. And so David makes this statement in Psalm 24 by revelation. He says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, if that is not enough, let's go even further. He says, the world and those who dwell therein. Meaning the physical earth belongs to God, belongs to the Lord. The spiritual realms of the earth belongs to the Lord. All the possessions, all the entities within the earth belong to the Lord. And then beyond that, the people and the nations within the earth belong to God. This is very important because many times there is this understanding that no, the Christians belong to God. No, Israel belongs to God and we'll talk about that. No, the church belongs to God. The rest of us, we are just our, our own people. No, 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 no. The word of God is very clear that you don't belong to yourself. Whether you believe this or not, it doesn't matter. The authorship and the ownership of the earth is the Lord's. By virtue of the fact that he is the creator. He made it. Look here. It says in verse 2. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. And so it says here very clearly. The reason why the earth is the Lord's is because he founded it. He's the founder. <laughs> he started it. He made it. He created it. It belongs to him. And not only the earth, not only the physical earth of the, the soil and the, and the ground and whatever is, is, is in it, and the trees and the birds and the fowl and the animals and all of that. No, the whole earth, including the people who dwell in it. And so it's very important that we have a paradigm, not a paradigm like this. Now, it's very important that as a believer, you don't just believe certain things uh, in a vacuum. It is formed... It is a, a belief system that is formed in a context of an overarching philosophy and mindset. So you have to understand that the overarching truth is that God is a creator. This is very important. And this is why I always continue to conflict with this doctrine or this lie or this theory called the the Big Bang Theory or the evolution by means of natural selection, right? This is important that we, con that we contradict this lie. Why? Because if things happen by accident, meaning without a cause, and it is accidental, it's just a Big Bang because of some kind of material uh, that reacted, and that we as a species and, and human beings and, and just evolved out, that there is no design, there is no intent, there is no, no mission of God, there is no designer, there is no creator, there's no accountability, there's no manufacturer. It causes us to live very different lives. And so it's very important that we understand that the earth is the Lord, the whole earth belongs to Jesus Christ. All right, number two. The nations have rebelled against God. This is very important. So God created the whole earth. He started off by, by building nations from one man. The word of God says from one blood he made all the nations. Speaking of Adam. For those of you who come from a background which is having a little bit of a, a prejudice type of racist type of background, it is important that you understand that even if we look at the biological, historical um, lineage of mankind, it traces us back to two ancestors. We have a common ancestor and it is not a monkey. <laughs> Our common ancestor is a man and a woman that procreate by means of the design sexually and bring forth offspring. This is actually in the genetic historical data. It proves that we all come from one father and one mother. And so God made the earth and he populated it by starting with one family, Adam and Eve. And we see this in the book of Genesis. And then from the initial 
point from the onset there is a temptation that comes in because of a spiritual being called Lucifer, a fallen angel who deceives Adam and Eve into rebellion against God. And this is where the destruction came in. And so the earth is the Lord's, yes. The people who dwell therein are his, yes. He created them, yes. He made all things, yes. And then, and then they rebelled against his rulership by means of the temptation and the influence of the evil one who rebelled against God first. And now, I'm going to read for us here from Psalm chapter 2, verse 1 to 6. And this is also quoted in the book of Acts when the disciples and the apostles are whipped by the leaders of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Pharisees and the, and the temple for preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. And so they come together and they quote this. And then they are filled with boldness and they continue to preach and signs and wonders happen. So let's look at this. It's very important that you look across the globe and you consider why are the nations around the world not all committed to Jesus Christ? Why are all the nations not all in allegiance and surrendered to Jesus Christ? He is the creator. He is the source of all goodness and perfection and love. Why are, why are they rebelling against the Lord? Why are they rebelling against righteousness? Why are they rebelling against love? And we will look here at, at, at Psalm chapter 2 now. It says in verse 1, Why are the nations so angry? I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Another uh, translation says, why do the nations rage? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings, verse 2, the kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed one. So against God and against the anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Let us break their chains, they cry, and free ourselves from slavery to God. But the one who rules in heaven laughs. <laughs> the Lord scoffs at them. Then in anger he rebukes them, terrifying them with his fierce fury. For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem on my holy mountain in Zion. So we see here from the psalmist that he's painting a picture concerning the historical narrative of how nations have related to God from the onset when Adam and Eve sinned against God and then Cain killed his brother and then the rebellion against God and how with, with the time of Noah, the Lord had to destroy mankind with a flood. And yet after that, they continued to rebel. They built the Tower of Babel. They wanted to make a name for themselves. Instead of filling the whole earth, subduing it and cultivating it for the purposes of the Lord, they kept on es establishing all manner of idolatry, nations and cities against God. We have examples of the Sodoms and the Gomorrahs and all manner of nations that were against God. And then before Israel is initiated as a nation through God's covenant with Abraham, all the nations before that are worshiping idols, including Abraham's family. And so there is a, 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 a common rebellion because of the nature of sin in mankind that came in because of the original sin of Adam, all his sons, all his offspring are rebels against God. And so the nations have waged war, have turned their, their, their faces against the Lord. And so the psalmist asks, why do the nations rage? Why are they so angry? Why do they waste their time in futile plans? Why do they plot in vain? This is the idea that nations think that they can stand against God and prevail. They think that as, as groups of peoples, as tribes, they can turn against the Lord God Almighty, the one who made them, 
and not have the consequences for their due punishment. This is important that our eyes be open, that the earth right now is groaning because of the rebellion that is in it. And it is expressed across the, go uh, across the globe. We are yet to see a nation, a tribe that is truly devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ in fullness. Because they, they, they say here, the kings of the earth prepare for ba battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed. And this is a prophetic psalm as well about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the second coming. It happened in the first coming when they plotted and raged against the Lord. And then they plotted and raged against the church. And then they plotted and raged against the prophets. And now they will plot and rage against the Lord Jesus Christ and against Israel. This rebellion is endemic and it is entrenched. <laughs> and then it says here, that what they want is they want to break their chains. They cry, let us break their chains. Let us free ourselves from the slavery to God. They see an allegiance and a, and a submission to God, a submission to Jesus Christ, a slavery, not knowing that they themselves are enslaved to their sin and the destruction and death that comes with it. And so the rebellion provokes death. And yet they don't know that those chains are the ones that truly destroy their tribes. Why do they plot against the Lord? Why do they plot against the Lord? Why do they plot and, and rebel against the Lord? And then it says, but the one who rules in heaven laughs. Look at the attitude of the Lord. He is God. <laughs> he was God before he made the earth. He was God before there were constitutions. He was God before there were nations. He was God before there were tribes. He was God before there were philosophers, before there were politicians, before there were parliamentarians who wanted to, who, who, who tried to, to pass laws against God. He was God before them. And he will be God after. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And what is God's response to all of this rebellion? He laughs. He laughs at them. He mocks them. This is quite a disturbing picture. Who can prevail against omnipotence? Who can prevail when they rebel against God Almighty, the one who sees all things? The one in whose hand your life is. Who can prevail against the Lord? Who can stand against the Lord? And this is why the Lord is not crying and complaining. about. He laughs. He laughs. Let the nations try what they want. I am God. <laughs> I am enthroned upon the circle and the circumference of myself. <laughs> I need not be voted in. I don't need an endorsement. I don't need a vote of confidence. The Lord is Lord. The earth is the Lord's. It is his world. The nations belong to him. Not to the United Nations. Not to the League of Nations. Not to the BRICS nations. Not to the African Union. Not to the European Union. The nations belong to Jesus Christ. And those who rebel against him will find themselves mocked because God is not mocked. What a man will sow, that also shall he reap. And then it says, in anger, the Lord rebukes them, terrifying them with his fierce fury. And this is also speaking about the coming judgment to come. For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem, on my holy mountain, on Zion. So it's speaking about the supremacy and the way that God deals with the rebellion of nations is the appointment of a king. The appointment of a king is the establishing of a kingdom. The establishing of a kingdom is the collection of a nation around a king. And he says that I have established my king, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Awesome. So... The first one is that the whole earth is the Lord's. Number two, the nations have rebelled against God. And we see that even today. 
Number three, God has a blessing for nations who surrender to him. Hallelujah. This is so simple, but it is so true. And throughout the narrative of scripture, from the Old Testament, Genesis, all the way through to Revelation, it is very clear that the blessing of the Lord comes when we surrender to the Lord. When we rebel against the Lord, we dig our own graves and we bury ourselves in death and destruction. And so we're going to read here once again from Psalm 33. We are reading lots of Psalms, but it is important that you understand that the Psalms, uh, the, 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 the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks about how he, he, he expounded from the, from the law and the prophets and the Psalms concerning himself. And the Psalms have so many uh, revelations about the heavenlies and about how God deals with us. They are not just songs. They are not just inspirational songs. These are prophecies. These are realities. So Psalm uh, 33 verse 12, wonderful uh, psalm throughout, but we're looking here at verse 12. It says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage, as his inheritance. What happens to the nation whose God is the Lord? They are blessed. What is the converse? What is the alternative? Cursed is the nation whose Lord is not the Lord. If we reject God out of our nations, we open the door to curses and destruction. Because blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his inheritance. And we're going to go into examples now, but it is important that we have this principle clear in our hearts and our minds. If we want to be blessed as a nation, we cannot throw away the Lord. We cannot close the gates of the nations against God Almighty. We cannot say we don't want Jesus in our nation. We don't want Jesus in our schools. We don't want Jesus in our businesses. We, won't, we don't want Jesus in our churches. We don't want Jesus in our families. Can we just be secular? And it's fine if we say that we are secular for the sake of allowing an environment that does not impose a theocracy on individuals so that they come to know Jesus Christ voluntarily. The gospel is indeed an invitation. However, we cannot switch off the oxygen in the nation. We cannot, we cannot switch off the water in the nation. We cannot switch off the rain in the nation. We cannot switch off the sunshine in the nation. We cannot switch off that which is good and blessed that comes from God and switch God off and say, let's take the rain, let's take the sun, let's take the water, let's take the air, but we don't want the one who made it. We have to be willing. We have to be willing to open our hearts as a nation to the Lord. Why? Our blessedness is contingent thereupon. Our blessedness is based on the fact that we belong to God. Now, many times you ask people, especially here in Namibia, you ask people, is Namibia a Christian nation? And many people will say, well, we have a secular constitution. In our, in our constitution, it says that it's a secular state which gives the right to religious expression and, and freedom of, of conscience and belief. But we are not a Christian nation per se. And so when you look throughout the population of, an, uh, of our country as Namibia, you will see a lot of people, if you ask them, are you a Christian? Do you believe in Jesus? They will say, yes, I'm a Christian, barring a few others. If you look at the census, the officials come to anybody's house, which religion do you practice? Christian. There might be some influences now coming through in terms of Islam, in terms of Hinduism or whatnot, but Christianity is still predominant. Just recently, we had the funeral of the late president, Dr. Hage Gengop, and the funeral was completely infused with songs of worship and preachings and all manner of testimonials and encouragements and prophecies and the church was very involved and it is typical in the Namibian environment 
You become very Christian at the funerals. But the question is whether we are living as a Christian nation. If we consider how we do business, if we consider what happens with regards to our laws, what, what is our perspective as a nation concerning abortion? What is our perspective as a nation concerning the, 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 the issue of sexuality? What is our perspective as a nation concerning morality? What is our perspective as a nation concerning corruption? What is our record? Not only our intention, what is our record? How do we live as a nation? For blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. And we are right now at a crossroad, even as the nation of Namibia. There are many alliances that are being pulled around the world. Who are you with? Do you align yourself with the East? Do you align yourself with the West? Do you align yourself with the North? <laughs> Do you align yourself with the South? Do you align yourself with this ideology or with this philosophy? The question is not whether it's West or East. The question is not whether it's North or South. The question is whether we align ourselves with the Lord. Because the nation whose God is the Lord is blessed. Regardless of whether they are in the east or the west or the north or the south. And it's so important, even as we come into the next transition of our presidency, this is going to be our fourth president in the nation of Namibia. And we hope that the Lord will be able to take hold of the heart of that leader and take hold of the hearts of the nation to say, let us humble ourselves. Because if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and, and, and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven. I will answer. I will heal their land. There is a blessing. Oh, yes. There is a blessing. Oh, yes. There is a blessing to aligning ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're not just talking about uh, being uh, th uh, th uh, uh, a theologian type of person. No, no, no. Or theocratic. No, no, no. We're not just talking about the notion of God. No. We are talking about the person of Jesus Christ. Inviting the person, the real Jesus Christ, who today is raised from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the Father, who is coming to judge the living and the dead, who influences presidents and ministers, and politicians, and teachers, and pastors, and business people, and ordinary men and women. That Lord Jesus Christ has to rule in our hearts as a nation so that we have respect for his throne before we have respect for the head of state. This is awesome. So God has a blessing for nations who surrender to him. Namibia, are you going to be blessed? If you are going to be blessed, surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. South Africa, are you going to be blessed? If you are going to be blessed, surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. America, are you going to be blessed? Or would you choose to be cursed? Because you have to choose whom you will serve. He sets before you today life and death, blessing and curses. Choose life. Choose whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors on the other side of the river or the God of Israel. The Lord Jesus Christ. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I hope that as our nation continues to progress with all the discoveries in the area of our mining, in the area of petroleum and the economy, where wealth comes in, it can be a curse if the Lord is not front and center in that nation. Hallelujah. All right, then number four. We're just going to touch on this, and next week we'll continue with regards to this. We're talking about how nations belong to God. We said, number one, that the whole earth is the Lord's. It belongs to Jesus Christ by virtue of his creatorship. He is the author. Then number two, the nations have rebelled against God, and we see that all from the beginning of Scripture throughout till today, that nations rebel against Jesus. Then... God has a blessing. Number three, God has a blessing for nations who surrender to him. Hallelujah. 
Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his inheritance, as his heritage. Now, having said that, number four, Israel is special to God. Now, when we're talking about Israel, we're talking about a nation, a group of people, an ethnicity. And today, there is a contemporary nation known as Israel in the Middle East. And we are all acquainted, generally speaking, with the location of this nation that became once again a nation, a nation in the 1940s through divine events. And the people within uh, Israel are known as the Jews or the Jewish people. And the Jewish name, that Jew is derived from the name Judah. Judah. And Israel as a nation, if you look historically, used to have two kingdoms. The northern kingdom was Israel. The southern kingdom was Judah. Israel's capital city was Samaria. The, the capital city for, for, for Judah was Jerusalem. And so the, the 12 tribes of Israel which was split in the south in Judah, you had Judah and Benjamin, and the north you had the other tribes. There was a splitting and eventually there was a disappearing because of the exiling, because of their rebellion against God, they were exiled into other nations. And so many of the tribes disappeared, but the Jews maintained that identity. And today you can see that remnant that has remained, that is supposed to be, be the, the, the fundamental tenet on the geographical planet, the place where the Lord Jesus Christ will come and land when he returns his second coming on the Mount of Olives and enters into the, the city of David through the eastern gate. And so we see even on an on a international level, you can see the events playing out right now in relation to Israel. Now, we are going to go deeper into that next week, but I just want to read some scriptures that point to how Israel was not a nation before Abraham. So when God is dealing with Noah, he's not dealing with Israel. He's not dealing with a Jew. He's dealing with a righteous man. When God is dealing with Enoch, he's not dealing with Israel. Until he gets to a man called Abraham that he chose. Now let's look here in Exodus chapter 4. A couple of references where the Lord speaks to Moses and makes this very clear. Now Moses is, uh, 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 follows from, from Abraham. Abraham has a son called Isaac. Isaac has a son called Jacob whose name gets changed to Israel. He has 12 sons. One of them is Joseph who ends up the whole family of Israel into Egypt. They multiply there. They, they then are delivered by Moses and brought into the land of Israel, the land of Canaan today, which is present day Israel. Okay, now looking at Exodus chapter 4 verse 21, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, so he's speaking to Moses about going to Pharaoh, and this is the altercation that Moses was having with Pharaoh, saying, let the people of Israel go. They are slaves here in Egypt, but you must release them because God said so. He says, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. The miracle of the staff turning into a snake, the miracle of his hand going into his jacket, uh, leprous and then healing. And then it, uh, it says, but I will harden his heart. I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let the people go. Verse 22, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. And if you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. This is amazing. Look at the, the, the references of how God is speaking concerning a nation, a people group, Israel. And it says that God saw them as his son. And he was willing to clash with another nation, Egypt. He was willing to clash with the president, with the king, with the pharaoh of that nation and crush the son of that pharaoh. Because of his relationship with the nation that he chose, Israel. 
Let's look at another scripture here. Exodus 19, starting from verse 4. And this is just before the Ten Commandments are given. And this is God speaking. It says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. So God is speaking to the Israelites. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people, for all the earth is mine. There it is. There it is. So God speaks to a nation and he says, if you will listen to me, if you will obey what I say, if you will give me the place of Lord over your lords and king over your kings, then you will be to me a treasured possession, a special people. You will be treasured among others. This means you will be set apart. Here we go. You will be set apart from among all the other nations. Where all the other nations will be common nations. You will be the Lord's nation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord's. That Namibia can be a nation whom God says, this is my son. Whom God says, I will preserve my son from other nations. Namibia can be set apart as a nation to say, I will obey the voice of the Lord. I will build families the way the Lord prescribes. I will do business the way the Lord prescribes. I will deal with crime the way the Lord prescribes. I will have integrity the way the Lord prescribes. I will respect the church the way the Lord prescribes. And so a nation can be set apart, can be distinguished. Is Israel special from the onset? They didn't earn this. It was a grace election. Jacob was chosen by God. It is, a, it is possible for us to turn our faces and our hearts towards the Lord and gain favor before the Lord because of our faith. And then it says, for all the earth is mine. You will be a treasured possession among all the people. The whole earth is mine anyway, but you will be special among those in the earth. And then verse 6 says, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, a set apart nation, a special nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And so God is speaking to Moses and saying, look, I am making you a special nation. I'm setting you apart. You are to be a set apart nation. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to give you laws that are going to be different from the laws of the wicked nations. I'm going to give you practices. I'm going to give you traditions. I'm going to give you feasts. I'm going to give you holy days. I'm going to give you certain ways to do things that are not the way that the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Hittites and the Philistines have been doing things, sacrificing their own children and all their immorality. No, no, no. Those things defile the earth. They defile the land. They defile a nation. But I will choose you from among the nations. I will set you apart and you will be my son. You will be unto me a special people. You will be unto me somebody that is close and near and dear to me. This is what God desires for nations. And yet the nations rage and rebel and turn against him. Not only that, they rage and rebel and turn against nations that want to serve the Lord. And they commune together and they consult together. In all manner of congresses and conferences, they come together and try and sanction and try and oppose nations that want to serve the Lord, that want to fulfill the desire of the kingdom of God. Who can stand against the Lord and his anointed ones? Hallelujah. It is amazing the reference here that God is speaking to Israel but in, in, in the book of Peter, he speaks to the believers, to the Christians. And he says to us, you are a chosen generation. You are a holy nation. 
You shall be a kingdom of priests. God says that to us. We are already a special nation. Within the nations, the states where we are, we are a nation called the Church of Jesus Christ. The believers, that we are part, engrafted into Israel's roots through the stem. That we are part of God's people. We are known as those who have received the right to become children of God. We are the sons of God. Hallelujah. And it's amazing, but we are saying that this must go beyond the individual level and let the blessing go national. <laughs> let the blessing go to the whole state. Let every person in the nation benefit because of our alliance and our covenant with God. I'm reading here from Romans chapter 9 verse 3. And there's quite a bit of controversy even in the church concerning whether uh, God has a special place for modern day Israel. And some say, no, it's not the same Israel. If you look at the location, it's the same Israel. And I'm, it is a futile debate. But looking here at Romans chapter 9, this is the Apostle Paul speaking concerning Israel. It says that, he says that, look, they have a zeal just without knowledge. Their ignorance is so that the Gentiles could come into the gospel. And through the Gentiles coming to the gospel, there is a jealousy that God will provoke against Israel. Very special relationship. And Israel was to be the light of the world to the whole nation, to all the nations, to show them this is the way to relate with God, with Yahweh. And so we're reading here Romans chapter 9 verse 3. It says, uh, Paul speaking, he says, For I could wish that I myself were cursed, and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. And he says, look, I wish I could give up my, my salvation so that they could be saved. Then he says, theirs is the adoption of sonship. We already read this just now. There's the divine glory, the covenants. The receiving of the law of Moses is theirs. The temple worship is theirs. And the promises is theirs. Theirs are the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, others. And from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah. The Lord Jesus Christ descends from them. <laughs> Who is God over all? There it is. Such a clear reference that the Messiah is God. If you ever wondered if Jesus is God, there it is. Forever praised. Amen. Amen. And so he says very clearly, look, there is a special place that God has for Israel. We're talking about set apart nations. And Israel is a special nation to the Lord. And God chose Israel as the first special nation. Yes. So that, it's my firstborn son. Israel was supposed to bring other sons to glory through the Lord Jesus Christ. And God has indeed done that through the cross of Jesus Christ. He has made it possible that from every tribe and tongue and kindred and nation and family, that nations are coming to the Lord from different tribes and people groups. And one day in heaven, the, uh, John the Revelator saw a vision before the throne of God. People, a multitude that could not be counted from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. God is harvesting for themselves. And this is wonderful. One day in heaven, we will experience this in eternity. But right now, in 2024, in Southern Africa, in Namibia, let us e experience the blessedness. Let us experience the distinction even now. Israel experienced an earthly distinction. Yes, because of their faithfulness to God. We can experience a, an earthly distinction being set apart even in these times. If we choose to align with the Lord, hallelujah, and with his anointed. Awesome. So in conclusion, we, 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 we looked today and we saw, number one, that the earth is the Lord's. 
the, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. This is a paradigm that we have to have. Everyone, not just the Christians, everyone is Jesus. Then number two, the nations have rebelled against God. And we see that from the beginning of scripture. Then number three, God has a blessing for nations who surrender to him. Let Namibia be one of them. Let your nation, where you are watching, whether it's Denmark, whether it's uh, Sweden, nations that say, no, we are secular enough, we are independent enough, we don't need God. <laughs> Let your nation be set apart unto the Lord because you need the Lord. We are seeing now how nations are falling apart, secular nations are falling apart as other ideologies and other religions are coming in because they have thrown away the, the, uh, the, the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then number four, Israel is special to God. And we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more next week with some examples around the world about what God is doing in certain nations and how certain nations have been dedicated even to demons and what happened as a result. All right, so let's read here from Isaiah 49. What was the purpose of Israel? God wanted to use Israel in order to affect and influence and bless the whole world. Through Abraham, through Abraham, all the families of the earth, of the earth were to be blessed. And how was God going to do that? Let's look here at Isaiah 49, verse 5. Wonderful, wonderful uh, chapter. We're just going to read a couple of verses here. And it says... And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength, he says. It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, for the non-Israelites, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Look how he refers to himself, that he is the Holy One of Israel. To him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of the rulers. Kings will see you and stand up. You see, this thing is not limited to the church. Kings, nations, governments will see Christ and stand up. Princes, Prince Harry, Prince William, all other princes around the nations will bow down. Will, they will see and will bow down. African princes, all the Wakanda princes, they will bow down to Jesus Christ because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. And so the prophet is prophesying in parallel. He's speaking to Israel, but he's also speaking about Jesus Christ, the Messiah who comes from Israel many years after this prophecy. And he's also speaking of himself as a prophet bringing the people of God in repentance back to the Lord. I'm so excited, you know. Those who were seated in the shadows of darkness, in the valley of the shadow of death, in doom and destruction, because of our own rebellion, we were cursed away from God. But because of his great compassion and patience, his mercy, he sent his son Jesus Christ to redeem nations, to redeem entire nations, to redeem entire families, to redeem entire kingdoms unto himself, and that the world may be reconciled back to the Father. And today I've got good news for us, that there is a God in heaven who wants our nation to be set apart unto him. There is a God in heaven who wants your tribe to be set apart unto him. There's a God in heaven who wants your family to be set apart unto him. There's a God in heaven who wants you to be set apart unto him and experience all the graces and blessings of what it means to be in covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I want to pray for the nation of Namibia. And I want to pray for other nations. If you're watching us, I want to include your nation in this prayer. And my prayer is this, Father, in the name of Jesus, 
May your church rise up in every nation. May your prophets and your preachers, may your ministers rise up in every nation. May they proclaim that your kingdom will come in that nation as it is in heaven. Let it be in this nation. We pray that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ will capture multitudes of hearts and that entire nations and governments will be converted unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we know the prophecies concerning the end time and how they will turn against you, how they will turn against your Holy One, how they will turn against Israel. But we pray, Lord, for the grace upon Namibia. Lord, let our nation not be one of the nations that is rendered to destruction. Let our nation be a platform for the Lord Jesus Christ, a pulpit for the preaching of the gospel around the world. Let our nation be a nation of king priests unto the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, all the poverty, all the disease, all the sin, all the corruption in our nation. Father, we repent today of that. And we say, let your spirit bring revival in the nation of Namibia. Do not let our wealth lead us astray and become a God unto us. Cause us, Father, in the name of Jesus, to walk with the Lord and the blessings of the Lord under our feet. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let the devil, let the evil one not prevail over our nations. We pray, Lord, that it starts with us and with our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You might be out there and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You can receive him today. The Bible says he came to his own. His own did not receive him. He came to the Jews. He came to the Israelites and they rejected him. But to everyone who receives him, he gave the power, the authority to become children of God. Not born of blood, but born of the Spirit. You can receive that authority right now. That right and become a child of God. If that's you, you want to repent of your sins, you want to receive Jesus, pray with me right now. Say, Lord Jesus. I come to you today just as I am. I believe you died for me. On the cross, you suffered for my sins. And on the third day, you were raised from the dead. Lord Jesus, I invite you. I receive you as my Lord, as my Savior, as my Master. I confess you as my Lord. I believe in you for my salvation. I receive forgiveness for all my sins. I receive new life. I receive eternal life. I receive the free gift of fellowship with God. And from today, I'm a new creation by faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. If you pray that prayer, we believe a miracle has happened in your life. Please do comment on this video and we'll reach out to, uh, to you or, or just message us on the details that you see, uh, you see here on this video. We are excited about what the Lord is doing in these last days and we want to see God's glory in your life and family. So may the Lord bless you. May you continue to see the hand of the Lord in your life. Next week, we are continuing with part two of this series, dealing specifically with how nations are ruled from the heavenlies. You don't want to miss this. And then after that, we are going to deal with the principles for godly nation. And so it's very important that you follow all of them through. If you know anyone that's in politics, anyone that's in government, anyone that's in that kind of office, please do send these messages to them so that they themselves will also be blessed and encouraged through the word of God. Father, we thank you for this time. We bless your word and we bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. So we'll see you soon. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. God bless you. Thank you for listening. For any additional information, please visit our website on ianvintuk.org.